Welcome everyone to 22 Minutes in Lending. I'm your host, Vince Passione, and our guest today is Kareem Saleh, a trailblazer in the fintech industry and a passionate advocate for fairness in AI-driven financial services. As the founder and CEO of Fairplay, Kareem is pioneering the concept of fairness as a service, using cutting-edge AI technology to reduce bias in lending and financial decision-making. With an impressive background that includes executive roles at Zest AI and SoftCard, as well as key positions in the Obama administration, Kareem brings a wealth of experience in AI, lending, and public policy to the table. Thank you, Kareem, for being on the show, and welcome to 22 Minutes in Lending. Thanks for having me, Vince. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Well, Kareem, I always do this to all of our entrepreneurs, right? I want to find out sort of why, the why. So my research, Fair Play was founded in 2020. I took a look at Crunchbase. Looks like you guys raised about $14.5 million in your Series A. Uh, I know that, that NICA was one of your investors, as well as TTV. It's also an investor in LendKey. Um, and I took a look at the mission, right? And what I ran the website was, the mission is to build fairness infrastructure for the internet so that any company using an algorithm to make high stakes decisions about people's lives can ensure those decisions are made fairly. So why this mission and why now? Yeah, well, I think everyone from all walks of life knows what it's like to be treated unfairly, right? And the deep and lasting pain that unfairness can cause in people's lives in fact, there's recently been a study that shows that when people see unfairness, the part of the brain that alights is the part of the brain that's associated with disgust. Uh, and so, you know, I watched George Floyd's murder in 2020, and it's nine minutes of inhumanity, which if you haven't seen it will affect you deeply. And, you know, his murder, I think, prompted us, like a lot of people, to ask, what can I do in to change, right, to improve the system that I operate in, right, the system that I have influence in? And for us, it was a personal call to action to kind of drive change in the domain that we operate in, which is financial services. And my co-founder and I were early to the application of uh, AI in lending, um, and we knew that uh, AI is extremely powerful, uh, has the potential to increase approval rates, increase take rates, uh, but also machine learning is capable of learning the wrong things. And I've got some funny stories to tell you about that sometime. But um, because AI is taking over more and more decisions in our lives, the risk of unfairness in AI decisions could deny people jobs, deny people homes, deny people healthcare, deny people government services, and deny people financial services. Uh, and so we founded the company, and our mission, as you say, is to de-bias digital decisions. So, so you talk about fairness as a service, but but what what is fairness? How do you define yeah. fairness in that in, in that realm? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, there are many different definitions of fairness, something like 21 at least that I know of. And the difficulty is that many of them conflict with one another. But for those of us who work in financial services, we have the benefit of a regulatory regime, which actually has two definitions of fairness. One's called disparate treatment and one's right. called disparate impact. And disparate treatment is like, am I treating you differently uh, because of who you are, right? So like for many years, uh, women were prohibited from getting credit cards unless they had the authorization of a man, uh, right? They were being treated inherently differently because of who they are. That's disparate treatment. Uh, disparate impact is, am I, do I, is my, are my decisions, do my decisions appear to be neutral? but in fact are causing an unjustified adverse outcome on some particular community. Uh, and so the good news is that there are definitions of fairness in financial services, and there are kind of statistical or mathematical ways that you can try to answer those questions. And so I know, I think I know the answer to this, but first is, look, we had all these regs to make sure that we were being fair when we were doing it the old way. And we'll talk about tech in a minute. I want to dive into linear, the old method of linear regression testing. And, and now AI comes along. And the whole thought of AI is, well, it's going to solve the problem, right? It's going to eliminate bias. It has this ability to deal with all these attributes. So, so what went wrong? Well, it's more about AI has this tendency to overfit its decisions on 
populations in the data uh, that are well represented, populations in the data um, whose information is present and correct. Uh, and the problem, of course, is that for all kinds of historical reasons, there are many populations for whom the data is messy, missing, or wrong. And the good news about AI is that it can consume all that data that's messy, missing, or wrong, where the traditional methodologies couldn't. Uh, but it, in consuming all that information, it has a natural tendency to overfit its decision-making criteria to the populations that it understands, that are easy to score. But that means that there are a lot of populations which are hard to score, and the, if you don't correct for the natural tendency that AI has, those it, the models or the algorithms, the AIs, won't spend much time trying to understand how to underwrite these harder to score populations. And so that's fundamentally the risk, uh, that for populations that are hard to score, whose data is more likely to be messy, missing, or wrong, um, the AIs will systemically rate them as riskier. Okay, so we're, we're going to get into why, why, and you're using AI to to determine whether those those models have bias in them. And I want, I want to get back to that for a minute, right? Because it seems like there may be a, an interesting sort of loop in that logic. We we joke that AI is both the problem and the solution. Exactly, exactly. That's what I was thought, thinking about as I, I was sort of listening to some of your prior podcasts. But let's step back. Let's talk about the history of around technology that was used yeah. to make these kinds of decisions. So I've been around financial services for over 40 years. I've been in lending for probably 30 of those years. And my entire career in lending, we use the, what I would call the old fashioned historical model of credit scoring, where we use linear regression models around a dependent variable like probability that you'll pay. And we looked at independent variables, right? Like your income uh, or, your 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 payments or your other other loans. So, talk to my listeners about that versus well, AI was going to fix it. How does it differ? And then I want to go back to this discussion about this interesting problem of AI is the solution and probably also the problem. Yeah. So you're right that um, it's not like we're coming to these issues of fairness and predictive models without the benefit of. 30 plus years of financial institutions trying to comply with the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Fair Housing Act and uh, other laws that prohibit discrimination in a, in a range of domains. But, you know, the old logistic regression model world, right, logistic regression models kind of assume linear relationships, but like it turns out that a lot of credit behaviors are nonlinear. Uh, and in order to capture um, what's really going on in a machine learning model requires a much more sophisticated analysis than what require than what's required to capture what's going on in a logistic regression model logistic regression model you can kind of just look at the coefficients on the variables and understand okay my model takes this variable heavily into account or that variable heavily into account but the problem is that sometimes seemingly fair variables uh, will interact in ways to encode information that the machine can see, but that no human can see, right? And so what we find is when you are now transitioning to this era of big data, increasingly, I will call them black box, although many of them are also increasingly explainable models, um, and on, layer on top of that, a choppy credit environment where lenders are constantly adjusting their approval rates to account for things like the Federal Reserve raising interest rates three times in 2022 uh, or, um, uh, you know, inflation. <laughs> right. And so in a world where uh, of big data, artificial intelligence, and an uncertain macroeconomic environment, you can't do a kind of low rigor, infrequent fair lending analysis, which is what I would argue was kind of done in the old way. It was kind of done annually, done retrospectively, right. yeah, exactly. uh, and done kind of on this univariate basis. Uh, but in a world, we're, we're headed for a world of kind of continuous underwriting with 
all kinds of data inputs and you can't basically have underwriting for the AI, underwriting for the AI age and compliance from the stone age, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're gotta be as sophisticated in your governance of these models as the, as the systems are. So let's go back to maybe just take an example. So one of my clients were, were lending actively in 2022 to consumers and the stimulus, ch stimulus checks that went out caused those individuals to suddenly have this windfall in their checking account. And many of those models, traditional models, picked that up. And you went from potentially having a FICO score of, I don't know, 680 to perhaps maybe 720, 730. So I think most of my clients would understand that the historical way of, of underwriting that particular customer probably got you in trouble. Now, talk about how AI would have caught that. And then I want you to talk a little bit about now on the bias side, if I was a thin file customer, right? Um, how would your algorithm pick that up and say, look, this is what you're doing. This is why. Basically, the answer to all of that is very uh, robust monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. uh, monitoring the in the distribution of the inputs to the system, the mo monitoring the distribution of the outputs to the system. Um, uh, monitoring the fairness outcomes of the system, all right, so that you have essentially 24-7, 365 visibility into who's walking through the door, uh, are the decisions about them being made reasonably, has there been any shift either in the macroeconomic environment or in the, or in the distribution of people that the model is approving, um, and you know, is the model what? What are the model's fairness trends? That's a thing that we're doing a lot these days for folks. Is kind of monitoring the fairness outcomes so you can get ahead of a regulatory risk instead of the old way where you wait a year and then look back retrospectively to see if you had a problem. Okay, so uh, let's move to. We're going to talk about about tech some more, but I want to move to data, the data furnishing side of the credit reporting business because we had Christian Woodhelm on. He's a Len Key alum, but now he runs a firm called Bloom Credit. And they built a business called Furnish Data Furnishing of a Sur as a Service, where they're helping fintechs, right? Who couldn't figure out how to furnish properly and were making mistakes, how to improve that process and take some of the noise, right? Add a poor data furnishing, which affects consumers' bureaus, right? Um, but his comment was more around the, the rails today for reporting aren't set up to take on a lot of the data, alternative data, that we probably need to consume in order to get those AI models to work well. And, and you talk about you know, sort of these seemingly disconnected variables. So what are some examples of those variables? And do you agree with Christian that, that the current rails for furnishing probably don't support reporting those variables back to the bureaus? So on, on, on variable interactions, we see them all the time. And if you think about it, um, there are all kinds of ways in which variables interact in your life and you may not realize it. So like, let me give you a few examples. Um, let us say for a moment that we were trying to build a model that predicts the sex of an individual. It's a terrible idea. We would never do that in financial services. It's illegal. I'm only trying to make a point. Right. And what if I told you that as an input to that model, I was going to give you height. Well, you'd say um, height is somewhat predictive of sex because men tend to be taller than women. But of course, height is not perfectly predictive of sex because there are some really tall women in the world and there's some really short men in the world. So what if I told you, okay, in addition to height, I'm going to give you weight because even at the same weight, height, excuse me, men tend to be heavier than women due to things like bone muscle des density and testosterone. But of course, the problem with a model that seeks to predict sex on the basis of height and weight is that it's going to misclassify every child as a woman. Right? So what if I told you, okay, I'm going to give you birth date to control for the fact that there are children in the world. Well, now our system, our model of predicting sex is looking pretty good. But if I told you a moment ago that birth date was predictive of sex, you would have told me I was crazy. Mm 
But this is just a see a way an example of how these seemingly fair, seemingly independent variables interact in predictive models to encode information that we could never imagine was there. Uh, and so the challenge is how do you maximize the predictive power of that information, but minimize the disparity driving effect it's having on these groups? So those are incremental variables and we were talking about data furnishing. So mm. how do you now take that and can you furnish that? Uh, it's really hard. Your colleague who was on and told, I mean, we produce an amount of data exhaust that is an order of magnitude bigger than what was conceived when the credit furnishing infrastructure was built. Yeah. So you're, it's like hard to report this stuff back. Um, and I know that the bureaus are working on it uh, and I, I think Metro two reporting is going to improve some of that, but, but um, it's hard. So you touched on gender in one of your examples and you wrote an article that was fantasy through awareness and really discussing like the need for demographic data. And, and I think you said it's time we start using race and gender to combat bias, which seems to be co contradicting itself. So didn't we build these algorithms so that, I mean, I have clients today that will not take a picture, an ID, uh, before they make the credit decision for fear of somehow biasing the decision. So explain that, Kareem. Yeah. So this idea that we're, as I just showed, as I just explained to you through the uh, ways in which these seemingly fair variables actually encode information, this idea that we're not using it because it's not explicitly on the list of stuff we're using, that's just like a story we tell ourselves to feel good at night, you know, to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. We are using it. Uh, it's just encoded in this other pieces of information. I don't think anyone is saying use it directly because that's illegal. So so the whole question is just like, how do you use it? At what stage do you use it, et cetera? And, you know, Zest has a technique and Upstart has a technique. And I actually, to be perfectly honest with you, don't think any of the techniques uh, we have a technique, <laughs> right? I talked about the two techniques that, that we use. Uh, and while I am quite proud of them because, and my name is on the patents and I'm really excited about that because I'd never invented anything before. Um, I also think that the techniques don't really matter very much. <laughs> uh, I think what matters is, oh, given a technique and a range of options, how do you pick, right? <laughs> And, and there, I do think we've actually done the best work because we've created this stress testing methodology, which allows you to compare how two models are going to perform, both from an accuracy perspective and from a fairness perspective, under many different through-the-door populations and at many different credit policies and approval rates. And that allows you to objectively stack rank your options uh, in a world where you can generate hundreds or thousands of alternative models. And so the question is like, well, I don't think any of us think you should use it as a direct input to your decisioning that has all kinds of legal and ethical problems with it. But like when you're building the model, maybe you should understand that like women may sometimes have different credit characteristics than men. Uh, and maybe we should set the weights on the variables in ways that accommodate or that treat everybody fairly, right? I'm not suggesting that we reduce the accuracy of the decision. Uh, I'm saying that like, let's be as accurate as we possibly can, but also correct for this tendency to overfit our criteria for making decisions to the population that is majority represented in the data set we're working with. That feels uh, like a slippery slope. When you go to a regulator, you go to the CFPB and say, we're going to use race and gender because we believe that in the historical data, the bias is there, even though you don't realize it. So you might as well identify it and then refit the model. It seems like a slippery slope. How, how does the regulator react to that? Uh, believe it or not, the law actually requires it. It's just that there were no good tools for doing this before. So remember earlier at the top of the call, we were talking about the different definitions of fairness. And we talked about 
disparate treatment and we talked about disparate impact. Well, the disparate impact test says you can't discriminate unless it's in furtherance of a legitimate business objective and there's no less discriminatory method of achieving that business objective. Right. And that third prong, that third piece of that test, the less discriminatory alternative piece, there weren't really good tools to search for less discriminatory alternatives. So the common fair lending practice was to say, well, yeah, I might approve this or that protected group at lower rates, but look, it's justified by the riskiness of that population. And that was more or less enough to get your regulator to go away. But increasingly, and I think this is the thing that is um, important for your audience to know and understand, in a world of AI where it's possible to generate many different variants of your algorithm, many of which will perform effectively the same from an accuracy perspective, but very widely on other dimensions you might care about, like fairness, robustness, stability, et cetera, the regulators are increasingly saying, hey, those business justifications aren't good enough. Show me that you looked for a way to be fairer within your risk tolerance. So when we go out and we look at uh, learning data and how to get it, are, are there privacy implications about this? And you know, there's a lot, like lots of changes, 1033 and, and the consumer and their privacy and how they can direct someone who can look at their information or share their bank information with another application. How do you feel about the privacy implications of it? Ultimately, privacy is one of the most uh, difficult values that we need to preserve in the AI era. And I think these are decisions that have to be made for people by themselves. But I encourage everybody to think about whether there's some way of sharing their demographic information, perhaps in an anonymized way or through the census, uh, in a way that allows you to be counted. Because on balance, I think being counted makes it more likely that your community will be better served by the financial industry over time because you'll be underwritten to standards that are appropriate for you. Thanks so much for joining me. Appreciate your time and, and your insights. They were great. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe so you can hear more of our episodes and I'll meet you back here at our next 22 Minutes in Lending. Kareem, thanks again. Thanks, pal. Thank you for listening to the 22 Minutes in Lending podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. You'll find links to any resources mentioned in the show notes. If you're enjoying our show, be sure to subscribe and leave us a five-star review.